Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And if you're looking to create a great interdisciplinary team, then you're going to want to know some secrets that are included that you have to know about the next generation of high quality restorative and interdisciplinary teams. And I've got one of the best on today, Dr. Jeff Rouse. You do not want to miss this. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a few seconds. The Best Practices Show with Kirk Barrett is brought to you exclusively by Act Dental, the ultimate provider of dental practice management solutions for dentists and their teams. Act Dental is committed to helping you build a better practice and a better life. If you're looking to grow your production, motivate your team, get back on track, and create the practice you've always dreamed about, look no further. Give us a call at 800-851-8186 or visit us at actdental.com. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the Best Practice Show. Thank you so much for watching. Absolutely love the feedback and the comments and uh, keep sending us suggestions. And we're going to do our best to line up all the great experts and we're getting some incredible ones and wait until you see what's ahead of us. Uh, just great, great stuff. And today is no exception. You're going to see one of my favorite people, one of my best friends at all of dentistry. This guy is a genius and uh, I call him the rock star of dentistry, Dr. Jeff Rouse. So, hey, be before we get started, <laughs> and I know you love that, right? So before we get started, a couple things. We are shooting this live on Facebook. Facebook. So if you have any questions, uh, please add them to the feed and I'll ask the master himself while we've got him on. And then also if you're watching these later on, cause we watch the metrics, some people are watching this late at night or later on, continue to add questions to the feed and we'll do our best to see if we can't get you a great answer. Cause we want you to get the most out of this. Now, my guest today, He's been on before many times, and if you've been out there and taken a lot of continued education, you've seen him. He's one of the best speakers on the planet when it comes to great restorative and interdisciplinary care. Dr. Jeff Rouse, currently at Spear Education, he's got two practices. And so, Jeff, I know who you are. Many people know who you are. But if somebody's watching this and they haven't heard of you and they've been sleeping under a rock, who is Dr. Jeff Rouse? What do you do and where are you at? Hey, Kirk. Thanks for having me on again. Um, I am a prosthodontist. I have two practices, one up in Seattle, one down in San Antonio, and um, I'm a traditional prosthodontist. The uniqueness to my practice is that I started about 10 years ago looking into what was causing or the why of a lot of the issues that I was seeing in the office and started coming up with some clues related to the airway and taking it a little bit beyond sleep apnea and looking at what people were doing during the day because of airway dysfunction. That led me to focus in on kids. And so even as a prosthodontist, I, while I don't treat any children, uh, I absolutely want them in the practice to try to make things better. And kind of one of the unique things and what we're going to talk about today is the fact that I've formed two different interdisciplinary teams to continue to build upon what I've done with periodontists and orthodontists and oral surgeons in the past in doing just restorative dentistry, um, now you, you, that team has to grow uh, in order to actually satisfy the requirements of doing quality restorative care in the next generation. Absolutely. Now, you've been doing this a long time. How, before we get into the- <laughs> No, the, what, well, the hair? <laughs> well, and you just got the haircut too. I was, we were talking before you went on. Younger. <laughs> you are looking good. Like he posted a Facebook post last week and he showed the, the hair that he cut off and it was on the ground. I'm like, oh, he cut his hair. So you look great. You always look great. But- oh. um, it's on the way for you. <laughs> yeah. And let, I should say this, you're the midpoint of your career. Yeah, I, I could use it, right? Um, how important, you've been doing this- a while, let's say a while. How important, let's talk about the why before we get into the how, like how important is the team element to doing all this? Like I always joke, I ask dentists to give me a number, like how important is it to have a great team? And they go, oh, pretty important. I'm like, give me a number. And I say out of a score of one to 10, like how important? And one guy would yell 12, you know? So give us your perspective. Why is it so important to have a team in and outside of the office? So the in, let's do outside of the office first. And outside of the office would be, if we're talking about airway, um, and adding that to the traditional restorative dentistry we've been doing, mm -hmm. uh, you can't do it without a team. So 10 plus. So there, there, there's absolutely no way to do it without the right team. 
doing it inside the office, I, I would say could be done by the dentist, but it would not no it would ruin the restorative practice because it takes so much communication time that the dentist would it, it just wastes their time to do it. So this has to be done by staff in order to make the restorative practice still click. I, I don't want dentists to have to give up being good quality restorative dentists. That's what they're good at. They just need to add the airway component to that and let the staff do the bulk of the work and then just get the data gathering they've done and add it into your treatment planning concept. So it you can't do it without the external people and it would be unbelievably hard to do with, with um, without good s- staffing in the office itself. It just doesn't make sense. So, um, you know, a, 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 an absolute 10 you, on people outside the office and uh, I can't imagine doing it any other way than letting the staff run it. So I'll give a 10 to that one in the office as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now let's give some perspective to this too, because you've had to do this twice, um, you know, with two different offices and you've learned a lot and there are strengths and weaknesses to both. So just give us some backstory on that. Where are your two offices at? Um, I've got a process practice since, uh, or a practice since 1990 in San Antonio. Um, I actually went back to dental school or to residency in 2000 and started practicing as a prosthodontist in 2004. So I've been in San Antonio that long. And in 2007 or eight, excuse me, I started forming the team here that would be able to assist me in dealing with airway in my restorative patients. Um, Two years ago, I went to Seattle And in going to Seattle, I already had the concept in mind, so I knew who I needed there. So the team formed more quickly. Um, But what we were talking about is that there are strengths and weaknesses in in all communities. So every time I lecture about this and say, okay, you need these people, and we'll get to who these people are in a minute, um, each community is going to have a strong support system, but they're also going to have weaknesses as well. There's no one I've found that has the perfect team. Um, they all, and, and interestingly, the team will ebb and flow too, because I mean, there'll be people that are on board and doing great. And then, you know, all of a sudden you lost a member or, um, you know, or, uh, in the medical world, you know, in, practices change quite a bit and quite often. So, you can you can have periods of time when the ENT support is great, and then all of a sudden you lost it, even in the same town. Um, the lucky part for me is between San Antonio and Seattle, I've got not only do I have great medical communities, but I've also got teaching facilities that are producing physicians. So I've got hospitals, uh, University of Texas, San Antonio here, University of Washington up in, in Seattle. So I've got incredible support from the medical community in both areas and so to be able to think about my hometown which is a small texas town i would have a completely different adventure there so that's the one thing that i haven't actually gone through is trying to do it in a smaller community yeah absolutely absolutely well take us take us down that path you know start inside or you want to start outside of the office let's go through each component and some of the things that you've learned for sure All right, so let's do outside the office. Let's talk about the support you need in order to make this work that, although some things could be in the office, like uh, a lot of general practitioners would do their own ortho, and I I don't. I'm going to be speaking as if I'm a prosthodontist doing this, just a restorative-based dentist, that's it, okay? Mm -hmm. So you need to have uh, orthodontic support. And because there's different levels of care that are required, you're going to want the orthodontic support to be from all ages. So you need to think, who's the orthodontist that's willing to deal with a four-year-old child? Mm -hmm. Then who's the orthodontist that's willing to do surgical cases with me? Because you can always find the middle guy, the guy that'll do the 15-year-old kid or the one that will do the 35-year-old. It's the one that will do the complex surgery 
or the one that will deal with the younger one. So when you're thinking about orthodontists, you may be lucky enough in your community to have one orthodontist that will do all those things. I am in, in Seattle. I've got Becca Bacow in Seattle, and she's just a star. And she'll do a four-year-old kid and expand them and work with them, getting their lower jaw in the right position, doing all kinds of early intervention on them. And in fact, she's a periodontist also. So, so if they need a phrenectomy, she does it for them in the office. So it's an unbelievable, uh, unbelievably nice to have that kind of support in the same office. One orthodontist does it all. But come to San Antonio, different story here. I've got to find people that'll deal with a four-year-old child. The pediatric dentist that does ortho makes more sense in San Antonio. Whereas in Seattle, I don't have to go there. Pediatric dentists in San Antonio loves doing ortho and they're really good at managing a four-year-old. So that's perfect for me in San Antonio. But I also have orthodontists here that aren't as comfortable doing surgical types of ortho. So I've got some that are and some that aren't. So I actually have multiple orthodontists that I work with in San Antonio as opposed to Seattle where I get it all in one package. Okay. The next person you're going to need is a sleep physician. But interestingly, you need different types of sleep physicians based on the patient that you're sending them. So you need a sleep physician that is good at dealing with adult patients and you need one that will deal with kids. And it's totally different. The there was a survey a few years ago, there are like 3,200 board certified sleep physicians, of which only 500 felt comfortable reading a child's sleep study. So the lab has to be different, the, the physician has to be different in many cases. Well, in Seattle, that's the case. I've got labs that are, that are set up for kids. I have physicians that are set up for doing kids, but I, and then others for adults. San Antonio don't want to do that. I got one lab that does my kids and adults, and I got one guy that'll read both. A pediatric pulmonologist can read adults and kids, and he's just fine at doing it. So San Antonio is easier from that perspective. Although you and I have visited, I'm ordering less and less sleep studies down the road. I'm offering them, but not ordering them. They're not as much of a demand. And I think we visited two or three times now about the reason why I think sleep positions and sleep studies are so flawed that, uh, that I'm getting less and less today. All right. Yeah. So sleep physician. And when I began this journey was a huge part of, of my team and is playing less and less of a role now. Okay? Right. And, and can I ask you real quick, they're flawed and gives, you can give us the small snippet and people can go watch the entire episode, but just give us the, the reason they're flawed from your perspective. Um, you know, a couple of reasons. One is that it's not the regular night's sleep when you're in a sleep lab. Um, and the bigger one is the way they score um, sleep studies today is bait is almost set up and biased towards finding people, making people look normal when they're not. Okay. So they've set a standard that's so hard to reach, especially in children that children are routinely viewed as having a normal airway and they just simply don't. So, right. Okay. Right. So go back and check that episode out and Jeff describes that clearly, but keep going. What are some of your other thoughts that the, you have? Then the next one is ENTs. So an ENT, once again, it's kind of, it's exactly like the orthodontist. Um, orthodontists, some of them are good at certain areas of care and the ENT is exactly the same as that. There are ENTs, um, and well, they're kind of like dentists, right? You say, I'm a dentist, but some dentists love doing certain things more than others. If you bring your kid into my office and say, would you clean his teeth? We'll do it. Mm -hmm. But if he's got a cavity in his tooth, I'm not filling that sucker. I'll guarantee right. it. I mean, if I if there's a pediatric tooth with a decay, area of decay, I'm going to tell you it'll fall out pretty soon. I'll bet we'll watch it. it, it yeah. I am the wrong man for that job. So... There are ENTs in this community where people go and take their kids, and I know for a fact they'll never take out tonsils and adenoids again, and so they routinely say, we'll just put them on flow days and see how they do. So you've got to find the right ENT. Now in San Antonio, I happen to have an ENT, and I've told you in the past that he's in, actually works in my office, and this ENT is trained in sleep, he's trained in facial plastics, 
Um, he's also did a fellowship at Denver Children's, so he's good at kids as well. So I've got one guy in San Antonio that can do all the things I need done, but in Seattle, I don't. In yeah. Seattle, I've got an ENT that's focused on airway on, on adults, and I've got an ENT that's focused in pediatrics as well. Um, so I've got, I, I have to go to two different people in, in Seattle, and in fact, we have some issues trying to get tonsils and adenoids out in Seattle that I don't have here. I, I just don't fight as hard. So that's kind of the big battle with ENTs is will they do it, won't they do it? And some communities are more resistant than in other communities to do that. Right. The, la the last outside person, and there are many, many people beyond what I'm going to give you, but the four main people that you need. Uh, the last one is a myofunctional therapist. And a myofunctional therapist is the one that works on tongue posture, closing the lips, breathing through their nose. They look for tongue ties, lip ties. Um, they're just your, your physical therapists that you would refer to. Many, many of the dentists listening to this have used physical therapy for TMJ treatment in the past. This is essentially that person for you. So they're the ones that really follow up and make sure that, that you're getting good resolution with the case. Yeah, so those, absolutely. those are the outside ones. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you this question because I know you get this one too. A lot of young dentists are watching this. We have young uh, dental students watching this too. And they're like, Dr. Rouse, I totally get that. But how do I even start? And what would I say? Let's say I'm starting to look for these people. How do I approach them? What were some of the lessons you learned in talking philosophy? Because you don't find these people on the first try. I mean, it right. takes a, it takes some time. What, yeah. what, what advice would you give them? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is it, it, we always assume that it's hard, it's going to be hard work and you know that but once i find oh i found an ent well you're right it may not be the right ent and it may take some time to get that team put together but what i would say to the younger dentists is that you have you're already doing it right now or if you're not doing it right now you're going to be doing it because when you come out if you're going to practice at a high level which i assume that as you leave school I, that everyone has a vision of trying to be the best they can be if you're going to practice dentistry at a high level you have to have an interdisciplinary dental team so Michael Cohen wrote a textbook years ago on interdisciplinary teams in the Seattle Study Club. Rick Robley wrote a text even before that, an orthodontist in, in uh, Arkansas talking about interdisciplinary teams. Some very famous people have written about how to go about doing this. It's exactly the same thing that we've already done in dentistry. The difference is that right now young dentists or dentists in general are not seeing the same, are not having the same uh, impetus for getting this other team put together. You see, they know they can't practice without a laboratory. So they go out and try to find a lab. And when that lab doesn't quite work out, then they go find another lab. But that seems normal to them, to find a lab, to find a periodontist, to find an oral surgeon to take out teeth or put implants in to find an orthodontist and endodontist to do the things they don't really want to do. That mm -hmm. seems like a very normal thing to do in setting up a dental practice. This new generation of interdisciplinary team will very quickly seem like the norm. Right. And so it's not long before when you get out of school and when you're setting up your practice that part of the equation will be to find an ENT and a sleep physician and a myofunctional therapist. So it's not, it's not out, sort of way out there. This is going to be the norm and we just need to accept that that's the way it is. Now, how do you go about finding it? Well, how do you go about finding a periodontist? You ask around in the community, you figure out who's, say, near you or people that you trust have utilized them, and then you go meet them. Or you invite them to a study club or you, you know, any number of things. With Spear now, we're having add-ons to all of our study club modules that will be coming out soon that engages the physician in it. So it wouldn't be unusual to invite an ENT or sleep physician into do a study club module like that. 
and right. show them what role they play in, in what we're doing as dentists. Now, the neat thing is they love it because they don't have any clue what we can do and how we're viewing it. It's very rare that one of these physicians um, is, is confront, well, confrontational. It just doesn't happen, but is uninterested in participating. And if they are, that's going to happen with labs and it's going to happen with, you know, other people as well. So it's not, un, it's not just because you were talking to a physician. It's just because that's the way they are. Yeah. Some people are jerks. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's just the way it is. <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I call it the multiplying effect. When you figure out what you're good at and you team with somebody else that's really good at what they do, there's there's incredible things that happen that you couldn't plan. And that's the cool part about being a dentist is that the older you get, the more you figure out what you're good at and you focus on that and you let somebody else who's great do that. So um, I absolutely love it. Any other thoughts you'd have on the external team and the philosophy behind it before we go to the internal team? Um, the other, the only other one would be, or uh, Another one would be um, the myofunctional therapist can actually be your hygienist um, or assistants. It depends on the training that they go through. Dif there are different requirements for different people that are, that are trained. And so um, you can actually do that in-house. That's what I have at both offices. So the hygienists at both offices have been trained in myofunctional therapy. And so they're that makes it easy. I, I don't have to go look around the community. We just grew our own in the office. Um, if you do, I know some people are doing, um, you know, early intervention strategies with things like MyoBrace or Healthy Start. They're for younger kids and they're sort of functional types of appliances where they can um, try to put it in the mouth and retrain function. Um, those, you know, that's an, another avenue. So you can kind of do some of this stuff yourself or train yourself to do a bunch of it. Um, the other is utilizing it utilizing this as a marketing tool for your practice. Mm -hmm. um, social media is amazing. So uh, as you know, I can't, I don't know it. You, know, I, you laugh, you yeah. laugh because we were talking about how bad I am at it. But the people that are good at it, especially the younger doctors that are coming out that are really in tune with what's going on, to be able to promote a practice um, as a health-based practice, it really drives a ton of business into the practice. So if you then start forming a team and showing off the team on, on social media, you know, we had a dinner tonight, we're picking our team, here are all the ENTs, here's, and now I'm, I'm as a dentist working with physicians and we're, I mean, that, that you're going to drive an unbelievable number of people into your office. And I'm, I, a couple of episodes ago, I said my practice has gotten to where uh, a couple of times a week, people are flying in, mostly dentists from other places to have me look at their, you know, dentition and have me look at their airway and monitor their airway. And I, I told you a few episodes ago, I, I shouldn't be that person. They ought to be able to have a ton of people in their own community available to them. And if you want to be one of those people, the training is, I mean, is, is out there. So you just need to, to take it upon yourself to be that person. Right. Absolutely. Or at least be part of the conversation because when people are ready to do it, they're going to find the expert to help them. Yeah. So yeah. good stuff, buddy. All right. You want to go internal? Yeah. Internal. Um, internal is, um, well, let me do it this way. I had a, a, a lady working with me. Her name was Jody. And when we first formulated the program, Jody and I learned together and developed it together. So as I would um, learn something new, do something new, go to courses, whatever, as I came home, Jody, I trained Jody how to do everything that I did. I, so I would do it once or twice with her. And then I would just turn Jody o over to the patient and then she just took it on herself. Jody's husband uh, got a job out of town and took her away from me, which I still haven't forgiven him for. <laughs> so, when that happened. Right? So I had this person that grew the program and knew it ba better than I did, and she was gone. And so for about a year, I got to do it on my own. And while I was 
waiting for the right person and training the right person to come along and take it, take it over again. And I'll tell you, if a restorative dentist has to do this beyond the beginning, because there's a, you know, there's a price to be paid to learn anything new. Mm-hmm. So beyond the very beginning where you're, you're okay emotionally with everything slowing down and taking longer, if you have to do it beyond that, you're not going to do this right? because it takes too much time. Um, you have too much follow up. There are too many discussions or too many little bits and pieces that have to happen. So, and the rest of the staff will hate it because they're trying to get you to go do what you're good at, which is the restorative care. Right. So, you have to, to train a staff member to do this. I personally think dental assistants work better than hygienists because I think hygienists from a financial standpoint are better doing what they're doing, which is hygiene. They need to talk to people. They need to find people. They need to screen people, but then they need to turn it over to the assistant in order to actually walk through the protocols of the office to get them get the data gathering that needs to be done. Um, so this ought to be run by the staff. So it took me about a year. What I found is that I found I located less and less people that had this problem because I didn't want to deal with it. And so I, because I was the person doing it, I would start to ignore the problem because I knew how much time it was going to suck up and I'd rather just be doing restorative care. So, and unless you make the transition and start handing it off, you're not going to do it. It ain't going to happen. So it took me about a year to find the right person that could take it over. And she's been doing it ever since. Um, she got married recently and I, you know, we had to do a prenup here at the office. You can't leave me, <laughs> Yeah, but, but I know it's coming, right? I know, I know the next one is coming and I'm going to have to go through it again. Um, but here's what I'm doing out at Spear on the online videos. I'm recording how to train the next person so that when it happens to me again, all I have to do is say, watch videos, you know, one through 10 with all the training stuff that goes along with it. And we'll have that knocked out for you. So I'm doing it to protect myself selfishly and uh, but hopefully to help other people um, be able to train their staff. That's awesome. And we got a great question from a dentist in Latvia saying, um, interesting topic. I'm an orthodontist and I have some interdisciplinary cases with external members. However, I find the communication to be an issue. How would you suggest to communicate between the team members? How everyone, um, how do you keep them in line with the current status and changes during treatment? Great question. Um, I still am kind of old school. You, you have to go, I, I write letters, I write emails. Um, I, I don't do, I know a lot of people will do Skype or some sort of, uh, way of uh, FaceTime meetings, things like that. I tend to be better at writing letters. Um, my schedule works out better that, you know, when I'm on an airplane or, uh, when I'm working on something, I, I can write better than, than I can, uh, find time to do the other, um, the thing you have to do, though, given that I think that what the question was aimed at is probably talking to physicians about getting maybe ENT surgery or something. They mm-hmm. their world is soap notes. So you have to go back to dental school and in a way and remember that they they're all about subjective, objective you know, assessment and then the plan. And they do that. That's how they communicate. So um, I tend to write in dentistry, we tend to write a little more flowery and less scientific. And I still put that in there, but you have to go back to a protocol they're comfortable with. The other thing that happens is that um, they're not used to, that you have to keep in mind as an orthodontist in particular, an orthodontist is working and is used to working with a lot of different restorative dentists. And in working with interdiscipl- in interdisciplinary care with restorative dentists, there are, you're already used to the idea that when something changes, you got to notify the other person that, in fact, you're not the only person involved in the care of this patient. There are many people that are involved and you're just a small piece of a larger plan. Physicians don't think that way. 
Um, that's why the Mayo Clinic is so unique in that that's one of the few places that they think the way dentists think, which is in an interdisciplinary fashion. Most of the time, the, the way that physicians think is multidisciplinary. Right. Multidisciplinary is I will do everything in my power. And then if I can't fix them, I'll turn them over to somebody else. Right. They rarely think in all the pieces must connect. So as a, the, the question was referencing, if I'm hearing it correctly, is I'm an orthodontist and I need ENT help and I need sleep physicians help and I need all these people to play a role. And I also need it timed out correctly so that all the pieces come together so the when the, the patient's done, they're actually healthy. And that can be challenging with physicians and you just need to open up the communication. I happen to use email to make that happen. Um, and occasionally, to be honest with you, Kirk, I have to, I, with the ENT, have to have a few come to Jesus meetings along the way to remind him that it, it's a different world that he's playing in right now. And so that's a role that um, I, I'm, especially with my chil the children that come in here, I don't have a problem playing that role. I am a huge advocate for them getting healthy. And if they're not being treated the way I want, I, I'm, I'm okay with kind of being a, a butt and, and raising a fuss. And, um, in order to get things done. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll piggyback on the question too, because a mutual friend of ours, Christian Coachman, he, um, you know, the question comes up a lot and I'm watching a lot of dentists do what he suggested, which is just using WhatsApp, which is a, it's an app that you can use. It's encrypted. It's a text app and you can create groups. So you could create a group with all of your specialists inside and you can send videos and it goes right to your phone and you get notified. And so you can create multiple, multiple groups um, and it's all visual and it's all on your phone. So great, great question. And there's I'm, always, there's always a greater way to communicate, you know, well, I'm, I'm still doing cave drawings. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, it works for you, right? <laughs> so oh, good stuff. Well, let's keep you going. Already call, you already called me old tonight. Now, come on. <laughs> I didn't actually call you old. I never said the word old. I said, you've been doing this for a long time. And so, and you're only a little bit older than me and you know how that works. I would say you're a seasoned professional. Let's go in that direction. All right. So let's get back on track here. Now you, we, we started internally and we, you talked about Jody um, and let's keep going on that path when you're, when you're talking about the internal roles, what are some other thoughts that you have? Um, you know, the other person that has to play a role and, and the protocol that you and I have visited about the one that I, um, I call the Seattle protocol and we teach out at Spear. Um, it's really the foundation really came to me in, in people trying to find the right appliance for that particular person. Mm -hmm. The other part of it was I, I was just anybody walked in the door, they got a sleep appliance from me. And so I realized that probably wasn't the right one, but it also was a pain in the butt because you had to then go into the world of medicine. Mm -hmm. And most dental practitioners don't want to play in that world if they can right. avoid it. So that was another of the reasons why I came up with the, the concept of, and the way we actually treat patients is to try to stay out of medicine as much as I can. But with that said, there's still going to be times you're going to make a traditional sleep appliance and you're going to bill traditionally through medicine. And so you're going to need a front desk person that has an understanding of that. Now they can either get a software, which I don't have in the office any longer, um, but there are software companies you can buy where you can fill out the paperwork and do it all yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you can do it all by hand, but that's just a total disaster at a front desk person on a phone with an insurance company for two hours doing that. Or what we do is we just hire a billing service to take care of it for us. So my front desk is still a critical player in this because they have to communicate with the billing service. They have to understand and be able to answer questions that the patient's going to have about medical billing and, and how that all is handled and what to expect from them. Um, so they have to be a conduit to the medical, the medical people at that point in time. They also, my front desk is fantastic 
at doing the interdisciplinary part of this, which is they um, they have a monitoring system of where is the patient, because that's what I that's what I am I'm constantly doing with them. I walk up to them and go, "Where is Jim?" and that's and for them to be able to go, he's here. And mm -hmm. so they've got a great way of following all these people and knowing when the appointment was scheduled for the ENT. Did they follow up with the ENT appointment? You know, is when is their sleep study schedule? Have I gotten that back from the laboratory yet? And once a week, they'll sit down with me and my staff member that runs the program and we go over every patient that's outstanding and what we ought to do next. So we spend a half hour once a week doing that. Okay. So that's the other internal person that does. That's great. Any other considerations for a front desk person? Because, you know, they got to be trained really well on your philosophy and be able to answer questions confidently and guide patients. But what are some of the other lessons you've learned in that role internally that you would share? They got to be really smart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, I... Um, I have been, I have, uh, I, I have been fortunate, um, to have had really, really smart people. Um, and they're great with, they're great people person, you know, also they're really good with people. Um, so my first staff, my first person in my office was kind of like my mom and she took care of me for years and years and she recently passed away. And patients from a hundred years ago in my practice still tell, we sat around and told stories about how wonderful she was for yeah. months. Uh, and the, my new staff is, is brilliant as well. Uh, I've had challenges and we've had issues along the way. Um, but in order for any office that does really good interdisciplinary communication with orthodontists, periodontists, all the rest, this kind of falls in the same vein as that. So there's not any new challenge that they have. It just grows with, with the network. Do they have to be trained as to why, uh, you know, what's going on? They do in a way, but it kind of makes sense, right? Everyone knows what an ENT does. Everyone, that, you know, they know they take out tonsils and adenoids. They know they clean out sinuses. They know they fix deviated septums. Everyone has heard about sleep studies. So it's, these are not really, you know, uh, it, while they're outside of dentistry, everyone has that experience. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the same as if you hire somebody that's been a banker that comes in and runs your office and they have to learn dentistry because the nuances of dentistry are, are well outside of the normal vernacular of a person that's going to be coming into the office. So I don't think that part of it's very challenging, to be honest with you. Okay. All right. Great. Great. Who's the next person internally to consider? You know, the person that I told you about Jody, and then you have to yeah. find somebody that, that can take over that job. And they're the, the, the two things they have to have, well, three things. Uh, one is they have to, in my opinion, be, a, be uh, the people type of person. I think they have to have a caring attitude and, and a desire to get make people healthier. They can't be the analytical, you know, they, they have to be the warm fuzzy. At least that's what I think works best. Um, the next is they do, they can't just be all warm fuzzy. They do have to have some of the analytical part of it because they're going to have their own schedule to run. They're going to have telephone calls to make. They're going to have follow-up appointments to take care of. They're going to have a, a communication that has to be done with the physicians. They're the ones that are responsible for writing the ENT. If I say, please have them follow up with so-and-so, they, they're the ones that write that letter and get it done. So right. they, have to have, um, they have to have some of the analytical part of them as, uh, as well. Um, so they got to be able to give people hugs. They got to have the analytical part of them. Um, and I'm too old to remember the third one. It was brilliant though. <laughs> I can't well, remember. Well, maybe it'll come to you. But, it'll come to me. <laughs> but answer, answer this question because. Oh, you, oh, I know it. I got, oh, it. I got it. Go, 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 they got, go. They got, they got to have a story. Oh, tell me more. What do you mean? So the best ones are the ones that have stories. So Jody, I was telling you about her husband had sleep apnea. 
And they made an appliance for him, and you know she could tell the story. And then her son needed his tonsils and adenoids out, and needed expansion and all the rest. So she had stories to tell from the severe apnea all the way to the little kid. And my next assistant, she has the problem as well, and her husband has the problem as well. So I think, and and it's not that you have to go looking for this everybody's got a story. They just have to find the story. It's going to be them or their mom or their husband or their whatever, but they have to have a story to tell the patient to ingratiate themselves with the patient and let them know that they can empathize. Absolutely. That's huge. That is absolutely huge. And uh, a great way, it's a great filtering way when you're interviewing is ask people their stories, you know, because you're going to get more information than you could probably legally. You're going to be like, oh my gosh, did you know, did you know this is an interview? (laughs) You know, it's funny that, but you're right. Everybody's got to have a story because the story kind of tells you who they are and they can share that story. Now, one other thing that I want to ask you too, because You've gone through this evolution, and I love asking restorative dentists this. How much do you let your assistants do? And tell us the evolution of that. Because you know where I'm going with this. Because some dentists don't let their assistants do anything. Um, And and that causes challenges. But then others say, hey, look, I believe in you. And they'll let their assistants do everything up to the line. And maybe even cross it a few times and pull them back. But give us your philosophy on that. I just, I'm curious. Okay, so I've got two different philosophies. Okay. Um, anything, anything that I do with my hands, I do myself. Okay. So I pack cord, I make impressions, I make provisionals, I adjust everything, I cement everything. If, if I'm doing it with my hands, I'm the only one that does it. So I know a lot of restorative practices, the assistant, you know, they prep the tooth and the assistant takes over. And some of them, some states, they they even have the hygienists make them numb. They just walk in, cut teeth, and they're pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not, when I sit down to do something with my hands, I'm doing every single bit, uh, every piece of that. Okay, so my philosophy. Um, In the airway part of this, The only part I do is the interview and the exam. The interview could be done by an assistant, but what I'm finding is in the interview of the patient, they say words that trigger thoughts in my head as to what's going on. And unless I hear those words, the words, the same words don't come from the assistant when they describe the patient to me. So I feel it's important that I do the, the exam, but the exam is the same exam I'm doing on everyone. And the interview is the same interview I'm doing on everyone. I don't care if you come in for a veneer or if you're com- whatever you're coming in for, because as we have told you in the past, if you ask me what percentage of my practice is sleep, it's a teeny little percentage, but ask me how, how what percentage is airway, it's a hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Everybody gets, you know, questioned about it because a lot of the things I see that in a prosthodontic practice are airway related. So they all get questioned. I do the exam. And if they, I think they need to walk through this Seattle protocol that we're doing, I turn it over to my assistant and I don't see them till there's some sort of resolution that includes making impressions and registrations for uh, whatever the device is that we happen to make them. And then once again, the things that I, that happen with my hands, I do. So when the, the appliance comes back, I seat the appliance or at least verify the seating of the appliance. Mm-hmm. Um, like sleep appliances take a long time to, to seat. So I'll let my assistant walk through all the seating and adjusting, and then I'll come check that physically at the end. Um, but like night guards or anterior repositioning splints, I do myself. Yeah. And just throw photography, just give us your 10 cents of photography. How much do you do? Do you do any, do they do it all? Uh, we've, yeah, we photograph everything here. So do you do do it or do they do it? Um, they should do it. (laughs) What do you mean by that? Um, yeah, I mean, because I lecture with all the photographs, I do it. I do every every one of the photographs. They don't photograph at all. Um, 
two two reasons. One is I lecture, and the second is our setup is really heavy. Okay. So it's hard for my assistants to hold a mirror with one hand and hold the camera with one hand. It's just not set up well for them because of how the quality of the photograph we're looking for here. Um, so I, but if I'm, if I'm not lecturing, they're doing a hundred percent of the photography. Okay. I, I was just curious how you did that. Now I, I I'm going to ask you this because on the internal team side of things, we have young dentists that go, Dr. Rouse, I love this, but how do you get them to do this? You know, give us your 10 cents. Do you have checklists for what you do? And then you clearly delineate between what you do and what they do. And they go through a checklist on each one of these. Like, how do you yeah. do that? Yeah. So I, I teach a workshop out at Spear on how to do this. Okay. And for years, that, that was my weakness, Kirk, for years was I would just do stuff. You know, Jody was here or Megan was here and I would have an idea and I'd look at them and go, okay, we're going to do it this way for now. Mm -hmm. And then we do it another way. And then we, so, and then we would get into a groove of doing it a way and then I'd go teach it. It's like, okay, I think I got this figured out. I'm going to go teach it now. Right. Well, everybody in the audience, in fact, no one in the audience was in my office when I learned <laughs> how to do all this. Right, <laughs> so right, they, right. They, they had exactly that question. It was like, all right, so how do I do it? And I'm like, well, I just told you how to do it. So right. finally, what I did was I sat down before the first workshop and I wrote every single step out. And it's the duties of the person that I'm working with. So every step that Megan does is all written down and everything she does has a form associated with it. Mm -hmm. So when a person begins the protocol, there's a form that, that they just check off and write details on and we put it in a notebook. I'm still, it's a piece of paper. I know it can yeah. be done digitally. I get it. <laughs> There's probably an app I could develop. Yeah. But, yeah. but um, every time we have our meeting at eight, you know, eight in the morning, we, we got a piece of paper and we can just go to it and we know where every single person is. And so, yes, I wrote every step down. So when Megan is no longer here and the next one comes in, I can turn over this, these, this binder essentially and say, these are the duties that you have. Here's what you do, how you do it, the order you do it in. Here are all the forms that the patient needs to sign. Here are the forms you need to do. And here's how to communicate with our front desk people. So um, so it's written down. Okay, good. Good. I was just curious. And, I guess and as, well, the other part I already said was for the online video section, I'm going to turn those forms into videos so that everything you'll be able to, the people that have the Spear online, when they watch the video at the end, it gives them an opportunity to sort of click on it and it'll bring up a, an Adobe, a, a PDF of all the form. Absolutely. And you're going to give us a great opportunity to do that at the end of the broadcast here. So thank you, buddy. Appreciate that. Now, um, what other considerations internally are important to you in creating the next generation of interdisciplinary teams? Um. You know, we, I, we've spent a lot of time talking about screening tools that you need. You know, there are some devices that you have to have in the office, but it's not what most people, when they think about sleep, are thinking, which is a home sleep testing device. It's really more simple monitors. In fact, apps, you know, you mentioned there are all kind of cool apps out there. There are sleep apps you can get on the phone to monitor stuff. And that, I, I don't care how you monitor. I just care that you do monitor. Yeah. So if... Um, you know, a young dentist is out there and, and they look at a, buying a pulse oximeter and it's $900 and you go, good Lord, I, you know, I got a lot better things to do right now with $900. Well, just get on the phone and start finding different apps that you can use instead and then have it, have a sheet of paper written out for all the slow people like myself on how to go on their phone, find the app, download the app and utilize the app. So that you, they can bring it back when, when I come into your office, I can come in with a week's worth of data on it and I, we can look at it together. Um, there are a lot of those, but you have to have something like that. So I, you know, it really is, uh, we've covered in the past that you have to have some sort of screening tool. We've covered that 
this exam is exactly the same exam that you're already doing because it just mon it, it looks like an oral cancer exam. It's just with new eyes. Um, and then you have to have staff available to do it for you and somebody to get help you get paid for it. Yeah. So I, it, it, there's, there's nothing, you know, you're, you, I, I'm, you're asking about what do you have to do? What do you have to do? There really isn't a lot you have to change from a restorative practice. That's the beauty of, of starting to look, not turn this into a, a big clinic making sleep appliances all the time, but actually just doing restorative dentistry. It'd be yeah. exactly like a guy that says, I'm going to start doing more splint therapy on my patients and we're going to make a bunch of splints and we're going to see more TMD patients. We don't get this, this uh, blank stare from dentists like, oh my God, you're going to see TMD patients? What do I do? How do I do that? I can't, what? you just do it. Well, airway is exactly like that. There's no difference. So don't, they, they shouldn't be afraid of the adventure. Yeah. Now I have so many other questions, but in, when we're talking about restorative dentistry, we can't leave out the lab, your lab tech, as far as being part of your team. So, in, yeah. and that could be internally or externally. Just give us your two cents on that real quick. Yeah, my, I have one internally that will make some of the, I, I have, in the end, we're going to make some sort of device, right? right. In, and uh, certain ones are made in my office, but they don't have to be that. I mean, that's something that we get done all the time. That, so whatever lab you happen to use to make night guards can make different types of guards for you. Um, I love to use Great Lakes Ortho. Um, there's um, Prosomnus is, come, ha, is a sleep has a sleep device, but they're also making night guards now that are milled. So that's a really good lab that you can consider using. Um, I, the, the, the lab is absolutely going to be an important role, but it's not, nothing unique. Um, if you make, here's the interesting thing. If you go into the world of um, a sleep appliance, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have FDA clearance. You have to have um, I mean, it's expensive. So if I went to a lab and, and we just got online and went to an ortho lab that happened to make sleep appliances as well, and we looked on their, their, their um, website and we went to the price page and we looked for a Herbst appliance that's removable for sleep. Okay, so it's an upper appliance, a lower appliance, some bars between the side to jut the lower jaw forward, but it's designed for sleep, which means it goes through all the clearances for sleep. It could be five, you know, four, five, six, seven hundred dollars, depending on how it's made and all the rest, right? Mm -hmm. If you go to their orthodontic page and look up a removable herbs appliance for orthodontics, it's like 150 bucks. So it just depends on the focus that you have with your appliance. If your appliance is designed to fix bruxism, then you can make an orthodontic appliance. If your appliance is designed to fix sleep apnea, then you got to make an expensive appliance. So I just do it different. And yeah. my lab's a little different that I use and the costs are a little different for what I do. Yeah, so. this is awesome. On the subject, do you have time for two more questions? I know yeah. we're keeping you long. I well, on the, while we're on the subject of teams, you know, just so we can be a little like you get crazy people that have worked for you in the past, right? You know, I always joke when I speak to audiences, you got to hire a crazy person, and I ask everybody, and they go, and I go, you have to have that experience, just so you know, I'm never going there again. What? Tell us a little snippet on the craziest team member you've ever had, and you don't have to use their name, but what's what's like the craziest thing? you can remember in all these wonderful years of doing dentistry. Uh, well, now you say, I'll never do that again. Uh, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a little different approach and I'll get back to the staff. Um, my staff, every staff member I hire says I have the craziest patients <laughs> they've ever been around. <laughs> all right. So, I'm going to start there because okay, I got to throw that out because I there. have the craziest patients. And that, why? Tell me why. Tell me why, though. Because because, because I don't fire them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, some of it's because I don't fire them and some of it's because I, you know, uh, the 
at some point, the prosthodontist is the end of the road, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I remember starting to practice as a prosthodontist and a crazy person came in and I knew they were crazy. And I looked around for somebody to send them to and I went, oh, crap, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so you were yeah. a crazy person yourself, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, uh, have I had crazy staff? Um, I honestly haven't had those weird stories that other people tell about, you know, uh, the weird things that they've done. I've had bad staff members. Um, I've not, I guess maybe one of the differences is I've never been afraid to get rid of them. Um, even though it would have an impact on your workman's comp and your, you know, your unemployment insurance and or whatever, whatever the deal, un- you know, you'd have to fight them or what. I, I, I kind of got over that years ago and, I, and, and if it makes me unhappy to be here, then I, I'm going to do something to make myself happier. I do remember having a meeting about five or six years ago and I said, this has been the most unhappy year I've ever had and it'll never happen again. And so we're going to, I mean, we're going to make changes. And, and there was, I think only one person in that whole staff was around at the end of that whole thing. So um, it, you know, after that, that next year was happier. It was mm-hmm. lonely, but it was happier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it speaks to the point. Nothing trumps having a great team. Like just nothing oh. trumps. Yeah. No, I mean, I, maybe that is part of why I have so much gray hair, but um, I, you know, at some point when you get stressed out enough, you just, you either have to, I mean, you got to look in the mirror, don't you? And just right. go, I think the problem's me right now. <laughs> and, and take a deep breath and just say the words and move on. Yeah. And I, here's the other thing. Whenever, I don't think I've ever heard a story from a dentist that they said, I fired the crazy person and I sure missed them. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> right? Never. They never, yeah. they never. And there's never a story that ever starts with, you know, I waited a long time to fire her. Damn, I wish I, you know, it's always, I wish I had done it sooner. Everyone else knew it was better. You know, they never say, God, and it was such a mistake. Yeah. They never say that. Right. So just do it. <laughs> right. And so you're learning for the master. And if you're a young dentist watching this and you've got a crazy person on your team, it's coming. Here's what happens. They're going to make somebody else crazy or they're going to come to you. A great team member is going to come to you and go, look, it's me or her. You pick. You know what I mean? Like, so it's very important to keep everybody healthy around you. And yeah, uh, yeah. protect, protect your favorites and, you know, protect the people that can make you happy because I've been doing it. This is uh, 20 uh, next year will be 30 years. Wow. 30 years will be practicing dentistry. And, you know, it's just, if I was now three, four, five years out, um, one of the be- biggest deals is that you, you will always survive. You, yeah. it, it will be okay. You always think that there's an irreplaceable person in your world and, and you're putting up with things because you think they can't be replaced. And I, I know that feeling I go through it and I've gone through it so many times. Like I, you know, that's the person I need to get rid of, but Oh my God, they make my life so much easier. They do this. They do that. The patients love them, blah, 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 blah. But God, they're they're just killing everybody else. And you just have to not do that. You just have to realize there is somebody else that's better than them. That's out there. And it may take a few tries, but you're going to find them and you're going to survive. Oh, one quick story. So there were, I had three staff members at one point in time, two assistants that I worked with closely, two assistants and my front desk. So I was running an office with just one front desk member, two assistants. One assistant got pregnant, moved out of town. One assistant I already told you about was Jody. Her husband took her away and, and the front desk got, was pregnant all of these things happened within a one month period in July. <laughs> no. I had no staff members. I had oh, zero, no. zero, zero staff members. So I didn't shut the door. I didn't use tent. I mean, I found, you know, I called in uh, my dad's wife. I said, can you answer the phones? And I called in, you know, the, 
uh, Lisa, my wife, is in a, is a, a dentist. So I said, can you come up and assist me? And I mean, we figured out a way to muddle through and we find, you know, we were fine in the end. My hygienist pitched in on answering phones and checking people out. And I mean, I did it with nobody. I had no staff members and I still made it work. So it's fine. Stuff is going to be okay. And, yeah. and, and we, we, we just put too much pressure on ourselves that it's not, that it won't work out and it will. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, a, that's why what you do is so important. I mean, you're, you're the master. I don't know why you're asking me about this stuff. You're the one well, you got I, it all under control, but you teach people how to, how to hone a good team. But more importantly, I've heard, you, you know, you can't, you can't do this with the wrong people. Right. Right. You got to have the right team. So you're right. great at well, I appreciate that, buddy. But we get a chance to learn from the people that are actually doing it every day. And I always joke, you know, and this is every role in the practice. When you find the right chairside assistant, she changes your life in about five minutes. I mean, your life is transformed. So if you're in a place where you're thinking, gosh, this is horrible, I'm telling you, on the other side of the river, it's better. It is because there are people out there that can do it and they want to be part of your practice. Now, I got to ask you this question before we wrap up. Tell me what the future of you know, we talked about the next generation of interdisciplinary teams. What are we going to see in the next couple of years if I'm a young dentist watching this and this team transformation? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, team is going to get even bigger. Okay. Um, I think the joint, the joint and joint health has been ignored for a long time. And I think that with what Jim McKee and Mark Piper are bringing, uh, looking at discs and joints, um, I think radiology is going to be important, getting MRIs, uh, cone beams. Um, I think we're going to have more of that because interestingly, when we look at the patients with airway issues that are retronathic, they um, I, I've yet to find one with discs that are in the proper location. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's, that's one thing that the team is going to grow. I think oral surgeons are going to start playing a bigger role than they have in the past for most young dentists. Um, when I got out of dental school, oral surgeons were still doing a lot of orthodontic surgery and that's, you know, now they're doing implants and they're, they're taking out teeth and that's pretty much limiting their, limited their practices. I think oral surgeons are going to start be playing, start to play a bigger role and we're going to end up having to find this, the surgeons that are appropriate for doing this type of surgery. By the way, that was one thing that you and I did talk about, that these are one-off types of procedures, right? Yes. Taking out tonsils and adenoids, doing a deviated septum, um, doing orthognathic surgery. You want to do it one time, do it right. And I would suggest for people that are having a hard time forming those relationships that, in fact, sending them somewhere else is, is what what I do. Um, I've got a great oral surgeon in Seattle that's across the hall from me that all he does is orthognathic surgery on airway patients. That's it. Wow. I mean, that he doesn't take a tooth out. He doesn't do anything. I just sent out uh, three dentists to uh, Mike Gunson in Santa Barbara. Oral surgeon just moves faces around for aesthetics and airway. Um, there, are, there are oral surgeons that are set up just for this. There are communities where, say, if I was in Austin, Texas, I got an ENT there. I could call him tonight, tomorrow, have a kid in there getting tonsils and adenoids out because he's that on board with it. And so you don't, you know, if you're living in the middle of nowhere, you don't have to just go, oh, well, I don't have a team. The team can be other places. There's no rule that says it all has to happen in your own community. I have worked with a, la a dental lab in Seattle since 1994 and and when I didn't have a practice up there so I, you don't have I mean that's commonplace right that we work with labs that are far distances what don't be limited by oh I've got to have it in my own town mm -hmm. that's um, awesome. so the team the, the what's going to happen is the team's going to continue to get bigger and the team's going to evolve and change from the team that you had before as far as what pieces and parts and your team may be uh, a United States team rather than, or, you know, whatever. I mean, it may be, I don't know, Brazil, you were saying coachman. I mean, there could be the right guy in somewhere else yeah. that we need to get on board, but um, that team's going to continue to grow. And it, I mean, this is, 
so what, almost 30 years, this would be when I would want to get going in dentistry, to be honest with you. This is yeah. a really, really exciting time because the, the, we've gone through the, uh, the fill, fill the teeth with alloy and call it a day phase. We've gone through, like early in my career, the big perio phase where we tried, you know, everybody was doing perio programs and stuff like that. We've gone through the phase where everyone lacked uh, porcelain veneers and we had to put them on everybody and make them as white and as big as we could. <laughs> We've gone through these, all those phases and now the phase we're in is how can we make people healthy by doing the things that we do as dentists and being able to be a leader? I, I think that's the most exciting phase that I've heard of. Yeah, it is the craziest, coolest time to be a dentist. And if you're watching this, let me remind you, it's the number one profession you could have in the United States almost consistently. So you're in a great place in a great profession. Buddy, I appreciate this so much. And there's so many, like somebody watching this, they're going to say, hey, look, and I'm just going to tell you, you got to see Dr. Rouse speak. Now, you are sold out at Spear. Tell us what you're doing out at Spear. Like you just said, you said before we went live, your, your workshops are completely sold out. So even if you wanted to, you couldn't see them until next year. And next year, you're going to be doing, um, how many workshops do you have next year? Yeah, we got um, three seminars, which are the lectures, uh, two-day okay. lectures, and we've got six workshops, uh, which are three days, how to actually do this. If okay. you haven't really heard me or heard me in a while, I'd kind of urge you to go to the seminar first just to get the terminology back in your head and kind of the direction we're going. The workshop would be a good follow-up for how to actually implement it in your practice. Um the seminars, I think, still have seats, and there are. We just opened up two new workshops, so I think there probably have some seats left available. But um, you may hear from the staff out there that they're going to put you on a waiting list um, because it's. I mean, it, it's really pretty, pretty uh, exciting to have um, the interest in it that we've got right now. That that people are waiting to come see the course. So it's, well, it's awesome. You're one of the best experts in the world on this topic, and uh, we're just always grateful to have you on. Now, tell you're producing a lot of content on how to do this step by step, and you're putting it on uh, Spear Education Online. Tell us what that is, and you you guys have hundreds, if not thousands, of videos on there. What is um, it? Um, so Spear Online, um, we have different parts of the education system out there. We've got what we do at the campus, which is we're actually teaching people, both in seminars and workshops. Okay. Um, we have patient education vid videos as well. Patient education in the, in the sense that um, there are lobby videos, that, sort of like the Casey that came out years ago, mm -hmm. that people would play in their waiting room or they could play to answer questions for a patient. We've we've got the only version of that that has actually been tested on patients rather than dentists. So it's a really cool patient education type of, of setup that you can get in the online service. But the, the, the foundation of the online is actually lectures that are given by all the faculty members out there and some people that we bring in to lecture. And it's kind of like a YouTube deal where you go on and you, you look up certain topics and that leads you to other topics and you wander around. And there are thousands of videos that we've done. And... Um, it's really neat to hear from, once again, especially from younger dentists, that the way they use those services is so different than me. I will, I kind of browse around every so often just to see what, you know, my friends have done. And oh, there's, But they will actually use it in practice. For example, if a tooth is broken off, they've got a question about how to build it up or how to provisionalize it or how to, how to work towards extruding it or they actually, you've got a video that they can access right away. And the way the videos are done, they're done in short little clips. Mm -hmm. So you can get a, you can actually use it to get questions answered almost immediately. So it's a, it's very cool and uh, uh, addictive in some ways. Cause you, you start, you know, almost Netflixing the thing, you know, like the Friday night with your wife, <laughs> we're going to sit yeah. down and watch, watch some spear videos. <laughs> Oh, it's fantastic. If you haven't checked it out, you have to check it out. Now, you were gracious enough to give us, a, there's a great deal just for people watching the Best Practice Show, exclusively for the Best Practice Show. We're going to post a link. You can go on there. It's normally $189 a month, and it's well worth it. Like 
in spades just and you're going to give it to us for 169 bucks a month so um that in a, in a year that's 240 bucks um, so check it out. You can put it in there. I, BPS 169. Check it out. I, actually, Spears going to do that. I'm not getting in. Oh, Frank's going to do that. That's awesome. Thank no. you, Frank. That's awesome. Yeah, I thought that was coming from you. I thought you were just kind of no, giving us here. a discount. That's check, awesome. Checks can be made out too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Jeff Rouse. <laughs> Jeff, will, is- yeah, with his money, will be buying an island. He'll see you later. <laughs> That's there awesome. are so many people. I mean, there are, I think... There'll be, and I'm, I'm going to get the numbers wrong because I'm not a numbers person like this, but I think there are going to be like 20,000 people they're going to have on this online service. It's it's a huge community. And, oh, the other part of it that I didn't even say, if you if you watch a video, they have links to the people that did it. So I'll get questions all the time. So you have you have access to me whenever those videos are on. You can write me a question, and, I, and uh, part of my, con- you know, Part of me being faculty out there is I answer questions all, all the time. So yeah. it's, that's really cool. It is really cool. And you are in a tremendous wealth of knowledge. And we've already got our next show scheduled. and we got plenty more to come. So if you're watching this and you want to hear a topic from Dr. Rouse, please add it to the feed or send it to us directly. And I'll set up. This guy can teach anything for hours and hours and hours. And my friend, I'm always grateful for any time I get with you. So thank you so much, buddy. So, hey, hold on, hold on while we say goodbye to everybody else. And so thank you for watching. If you've been watching, uh, we really appreciate your your feedback, your thoughts, your comments and everything. And if you enjoyed today, which I hope you did, do us a favor. Just hit the share button and share it with your friends. And until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys have a great evening. Yeah.